speaker tonight is uh, Bob Hollison. Now, Bob is a 1968 graduate of Moody Bible Institute, and he knew Dr. Marquardt when he was at Moody, so they were up there at the same time. And uh, but Bob, for several years, pastored over at Baptist Inn Community. Uh, he's now on the pastoral staff at St. Mary's Hospital. Uh, he's a retired school teacher and coach, and he's a member up at River Cities uh, Church there in, uh, on Route 60 in East Huntington and teaches Bible classes in further. So uh, we're glad to have Bob here this evening. And I will mention that uh, their pastor, Brother Larry Green, some of you may know Brother Larry, uh, he was our graduation speaker this past year, last <laughs> May. But uh, Larry has some serious health problems and is facing uh, open heart surgery here within the next week probably. Mm. So we need to remember him in prayer. Yes, sir. But uh, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, Travis can come and lead us in song, and we'll get started. Our Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to meet together with our dear brothers in fellowship with one another and in fellowship with you. We thank you for Brother Bob this evening that he's come to share your word with us. And we pray, Father, that the Spirit would use him and fill him and enable him <coughs> to communicate your word to us, and may our hearts be receptive to your word. We do want to mention Brother Larry as he faces his surgery next week. We ask the Lord that your hand would be upon him and his family. And uh, we know that he has been a uh, great support of our school. And we just ask for your watch care and your blessings upon him. So we ask now that you be with our uh, chapel service this evening. May Christ be exalted and lifted up. For we pray in his name. Amen. Unto the world the Lord is come, let earth receive her King, let every heart prepare Him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven Uh, for me has worked better than any other version I've had 
Uh, I don't know if it's modern or not, but it's called large print. <laughs> the older that I've gotten, the more necessary it's been. So the bad thing of it is, I don't have access to my real large print version, so I brought a Bible because I thought if you go to a Bible college to speak, you ought to at least have a Bible. If you don't bring your Bible to a Bible college, where are you going to bring it? But I went to uh, BibleGateway.com to enlarge the text just a bit so that when I'm here, uh, usually blessed. I had the cataract surgery, but I am still dependent upon big print. And I'm just so glad to be here. I've known uh, Brother Arnold for a long, long while. Clifford I've known uh, since 1965, 1966. Brady Lipscomb I know. Bob Barber who was my youth pastor and real influential in the going to Moody. And I'm familiar for a long, long time with vision in this particular school. This school has got a peculiar type of vision. Peculiar in that... Uh, very few places would serve this particular niche that you're a part of. This is really a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to study the Word and to fall in love again and again and again with the Lord Jesus. And I'm just excited about being here. Now, Brother Arnold mentioned about 20 minutes, and hopefully we'll be within that time frame. He also said it was going to be a Christmas message. And uh, that's okay. It's the last uh, last chapel before uh, you all break. It's close to the Advent season. Now, I dropped that word Advent for, for a couple reasons. One, I work at a Catholic hospital. They never say anything bad about me when, when I share the gospel. I mean, they've given me an awful lot of liberty. It's been a really incredible, fruitful year. But... I've also got to rely on that term Advent for another little thing later on in the sermon. So I, I just thought I'd drop that in. <laughs> and uh, you will find me to be a bit on the bizarre side. I'm, I'm not real comfortable preaching. Did it for 10 years Baptist in the community. And, uh, but I am real comfortable with taking a look at the text. And so if you would be so kind, let's turn to the fifth gospel and begin our study with... Did I say fifth gospel? That's really what I meant. It's the 53rd chapter of the fifth gospel. It's gospel according to Isaiah. And it is quoted so, so much throughout the gospel accounts, the regular four gospels, the one that I sort of tripped you on. But it is a, a powerful powerful chapter. This chapter is a powerful, powerful book. I didn't realize how powerful it was from that then. I, I always stop off at Tim Hortons in, uh, in Ashland after I go to the prison. It's always good to go in there and get your donut and coffee and say, yes, I just got out of federal prison and I'm on my way home. But the night I will remember the most, I still pray about this night for a long time, was a guy the name of Ben. And we had the opportunity to share the, the word with, with some, some of the men there. And he comes up to me. And he, he has a head covering on. Being the sharp guy that I am, I recognized that he was either very cold or was not traditionally Christian. He said, you know, I'm Jewish. And I thought, you know, I didn't really realize that. I'm glad to know that. He said, we've got a different Bible than you guys have got. Now, I had to rely on the Moody Bible Institute training. I guess they train you here to know that there's like an Old Testament and a New Testament. <laughs> so I sort of played along and I said, you don't say, well, what's yours like? He said, well, well, I got uh, the Old Testament and I've got a copy of the book that's over there in Hebrew. So uh, he was an Orthodox Jew, he studied, and he did have time on his hands. One of the real advantages of being a prisoner is to have time on your hands. So he, uh, he's going to get the, this Bible, and we decide to open up to the book of Isaiah. Amen. And took a look at that. He said, let me see that. <laughs> so he got out his Hebrew edition, looked, looked at mine, he said, my gracious, this is, this is kind of close. I said, Ben, let's do something together. Do you have the time? Kevin had a real straight face. Do you have the time? If you will do this, I'll do it as well. Over the next two weeks, I want you to read 
the book of Isaiah. We call it, I use the fifth gospel on him, and he was as, as astounded or taken back by my ignorance as you all were. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I said, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read it. I want you to read it. And I want you to just ask one question each and every chapter. I want you to ask the question, is there any possibility that this book could be talking about Jesus of Nazareth? Hmm. Now, I end up see a lot of stuff in life. If you teach high school, if you coach high school, if you work in a hospital, you see a lot of stuff. I'm not used to being speechless. But his next words were, funny you should mention that. Huh. And it wasn't funny, ha ha. It was funny you mentioned it. Because what he, he said was, I've been reading this book. And this book said that there were, he told me, the number of people who had professed to be the Messiah over the course of the years. He said, in this book, this guy did the research, and he said, almost every one of them matched up the prophecies, uh, six or seven percent, except Jesus of Nazareth. And he matched up about 75% of the time with the prophecies. So some of the uh, Catholics who were there that I was ministering to and some of the others, they said, well, I'm putting on 75%. I said, well, prophecy. There's some that is still left, left to be fulfilled. And so we looked at this, and I want you to look at this, because Isaiah, how many of you are, are planning on or already involved in being a pastor? You show of hands. Okay, several of you. How many of you, if you were going to be, get the call from the church and they said, we want you to realize a couple of things going in. As you preach, as you prepare, as you minister the word, the people here are really not going to listen to you or pay any attention. In fact, they're going to be out and out against almost everything you said. Quite an invitation and quite a call. But if you remember with Isaiah, that was pretty much what God had told him. Listen as you would, Isaiah 53, 1 through 7. I wasn't teasing about this being the gospel. I want you to look, and what I want you to do, because you'll be you'll be used to this. I want you to picture the Lord Jesus Christ as we read these first seven verses. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken. Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of the soul. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he openeth not his mouth. Now Isaiah had the promise that no one would listen and pay much attention to these words. Wouldn't you like to have the ability to maybe have Isaiah be transported back to the first century? And he goes from synagogue to synagogue, from uh, marketplace to marketplace, and he looks at these people and he says, do you mean you didn't recognize that this was who I was talking about? Mm -hmm. I mean, look at look at what we wrote about and look at, at Jesus of Nazareth. Did you not catch on? How could you miss that? Oddly enough, as it was for Ben at the federal prison, and so many, many Jews... They are still waiting for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They're waiting even tonight. They're waiting for that one to come as the conquerors. I see you're probably going to get into some of that later on with the eschatology thing, because this is really an eschatology challenge to you with a little bit different twist. Because the Jews are waiting for the Messiah, but that's not our challenge, is it, to wait for the Messiah? We, we know better, we've been taught better, and we know deep down in our heart. But I want you to look at another... Uh, passage of scripture. This is the book of Acts, uh, chapter 1, 10 through 11. Because we know a lot about the first advent of Christ. 
Isaiah would tell us that even if we didn't have the Gospels. Isaiah would tell us about the first day of them. But in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, it says that while they, meaning the disciples, looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, Isaiah was talking about the first advent. I, I, that's, this will be the last time I use the term advent. It's, I feel really comfortable with it. But the second advent is what Luke was recording in Acts chapter 1. And that's what we're anticipating. That is the big anticipation for a Christian. It was a big anticipation for those disciples. I mean, it, seeing the risen Lord, it was just like pouring gasoline on these guys. Like throwing raw meat to dogs because they were aggressive in telling the good news. But it was for the early church too. First, First Thessalonians 4. 4 verses, 17 through, verses 14 through 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For with this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, you shall always be with the Lord. Now the Jews are still waiting for a deliverer. And our call, however, is not to wait. And the problem that so many times we have, now my typical sermon is two points, what and so what. And the so what is really strong because what I've noticed about the message of the second coming is so challenging to me that it convicts me every time I'm faced with it. Look at what Christ said in Matthew 24, verses 42 through 44. And he doesn't use the word wait for him. It says, watch, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. We are exhorted in Scripture to watch for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just wait. Now, if you ever have to take a cheap vacation, if you're going to be in the ministry plan on cheap vacation. <laughs> um, went to Nova Scotia. If I ever get a chance to go back, I'll rent a bicycle. When you go on a cheap vacation, you do a lot of walking. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget walking. You walk along, and they have these free little papers that you take, and they have on these houses a particular type of architecture I've never seen before. It was called, what was called a widow's watch. And what the widow's watch is, second floor of these house is a small, like a little porch outside the bedroom window. And what you would do is, if you were a wife, is you'd walk outside on that porch and you'd look out towards the Atlantic to see if you could watch and see that husband coming home. And so oftentimes, because that sea was so rough, what they were doing is, is watching and there would be no husband coming mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Our exhortation from Christ is to watch for His coming, to anticipate it every time. I would encourage you to not watch for the Lord Jesus today. I would not encourage you to do that at all. I would encourage you not to watch for Him this evening, not to watch for Him this hour. I would encourage you to watch for Him imminently any moment mm -hmm. He can come. Because what that truth does, it transforms your life and transform your ministry. It will put an urgency there that maybe you don't have. If you're waiting for the Lord, waiting can take an awful long time. Mm -hmm. If you're watching for Him and watching what He wants you to do. Picture, if you would, a soldier coming home from war. And you get off of the boat and 
there are all those girlfriends and wives waiting to see you. Except you look, and your wife isn't there. Every other girlfriend and wife is there greeting these men coming off. And so you wonder what's going on. So you walk, you carry your luggage back, you go to the house and you open the door, and there she is, she's fixing dinner. She said, you know, I knew you'd be home sometime. I was waiting for you. Hmm. Somehow it just doesn't it really cut it, does it? Hmm. Because the anticipation, and God uses the analogy of, of the church being the bride of Christ, hmm. is to watch with eager anticipation. Now, let's take a look at yet another passage of Scripture because it gives us a bit more to, uh, to think about as well because there's some observations about this second advent. I know how important the first advent is to all of us, but it does not compare to this idea that Christ is coming again. When? I dare not even look at my watch because it could be right now, twinkling in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 6. That you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Encouraged to watch, encouraged not to sleep. We live in a society that has lulled itself to sleep with so much. Uh, if you've ever had kids that played sports in high school in West Virginia, the trip you don't want your kids to take is the trip to Parkersburg. Because that means you have to go to the parking lot and wait for that bus to come back at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my kids didn't have the luxury of the car, so we, we go to this parking lot to, to wait for kids to come back. And all these, these cars are here because the other kids live in the school district uh, some distance away from, from Port Huntington East was. And we were kind of poor. We lived in the Innslow district. We were about three blocks away from where we lived. We didn't, didn't want our kids to walk home, so we were there. And we wanted to wait for our kids to come back because i got to tell you, we're good parents. That's why we did it. I want you to know how good we are. Uh, also, I want you to know that when we woke up at 2 in the morning, and they were already home, and we missed them. I didn't feel quite as confident about how good a parent I was. But, you know, a lot of times, we are watching for the Lord Jesus Christ the same way. We have a tendency to slumber. We have a tendency to relax. We have a tendency to wait but not watch. And if we are watching for the Lord Jesus, if we are conscious of the fact He could come, it would change our life. And how do I know that? If I didn't know any other way, I would go to the disciple that Jesus loved, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2-3. through 3, A changing, a life-changing verse for a man in the ministry. And it would be one that I would challenge. It would be a little bit different challenge than maybe any other generation we would challenge. The challenge that John would offer to you, gentlemen, is one that is so easily attacked in today's world. John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when, I want to make sure that I'm conscious that when He's revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Even those who might have been asleep, the gentle nudge, maybe woke you up. But that's not where the, the passage stops. Is it? it says, and everyone, talking about the children of God, who has this hope mm -hmm. in Him, purifies himself. There's not a period there. There's a comma. Mm -hmm. Purifies himself just as He is pure. We can't afford in light of this verse, not to be alert. My soul be on my guard. I think there's a hymn of that title. We can't afford not to be prepared, can we? We cannot afford to be in areas of our life where that uh, it looks as if we don't care whether Christ comes back or not. And we can't afford to be distracted. This is an area 
in modern society where it's so easy to be distracted. And he talks, and the term he uses, and, and I think it refers, it refers to a lot of things, but this idea of purifying yourself, purity of, of I thought of, of three things, purity of intellect. Yeah, you know, it is easy, especially being a Bible student, as soon as they figure out that you're here, they claim you're a Bible student, you might know better, but trust me, they'll figure it out, and they'll come to you for help, and you need to meet the qualifications about purifying yourself so that when you come, you are capable of helping somebody. But you know, so oftentimes, we spend, if you study the Bible, so much time trying to figure out who is the Antichrist. My generation, it was Henry Kissinger. In your generation, it might be somewhere else. And you spend so much time figuring out who's the Antichrist, when will he come, what sort of conglomeration will it be? Will it be the Roman Church? Oh, yeah, I think it will be until all oh, no, those. And then all of a sudden, but you know, our attention we would have in here is not answering all of those questions. They're kind of fun to toy with, aren't they? But the question is, is to focus our attention on Christ. And when you focus your attention on Christ, the other things fit in real well. Purity of morals. There was a time when uh, it was pretty easy to be moral. If you didn't, this was the theme at Moody, by the way. Please don't ask Clifford about this, because if he doesn't remember, it'll reflect on his age, not, not anything else. And at Moody, we were exhorted not to smoke, drink, curse, or chew, or go around with the girls that with do. Girls that do. Yeah. Today, the challenges are tough. Uh, 40% of ministers in evangelical churches have problems by going to the computer. They would, I remember I remember the first time I went to Highland Pharmacy and they had the Playboy magazine uh, in the plastic cover and I went to Andy Thomas and I said, Andy, this shouldn't be here. And he got rid of it. Now, who was I protecting? Who was going to have trouble with all those little kids? Really, it was me I was worried about. Because you've got to guard what goes in your ears and in your eyes. You've got to. And as soon as you say, why are they talking about this? I don't have any problem. I bet he's got a Oh no. You've got to look out for your purity. Mm -hmm. It's what you think. It's where you go. It's the things that you say. Mm -hmm. And we're careless. We are really careless. <laughs> and you can't afford to be because everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. And if you're wondering what that means, I'm not sure I know all the time. But it says just as he is pure. Purity of intellect, purity of morals, purity of stewardship. What are you doing with your time? Mm -hmm. What type of of stewardship do you have with your time? Uh, is every minute designed with your service to the Lord, your dedication to the Lord in mind? The challenge of the second advent, the, the first advent was marvelous from Genesis where it talks about crushing the head of the serpent of uh, there was a Messiah coming, a deliverer. And that was tremendous, tremendous news that there was a deliverer coming. But we know that Christ died. We know Christ was buried. He rose from the grave, and He's coming again, a second advent. And that second advent is one that is nothing but good news. It says, everyone who has this hope, and when you're preaching a funeral, as some of you will do, preaching a funeral. And you're looking for that word of hope. For the believer, it's there in the fact that Jesus is coming to them. Amen. And through him we have life. Let's pray together, but if you've got any questions or comments, we have 30 seconds. Do we not have our close to time? Close on that. Okay. Well, let me before prayer mention, mention a commercial to you. Uh, if you're looking for a good opportunity for preaching, hearing good preaching, and you have access to a computer, if you go to the Moody Radio Network, they have about four or five different radio channels in there, one of which is called Proclaim. And from morning till night, you can't get a good schedule on there. You just have to uh, just trust that sometimes when you turn it on. But anyone from, from Henry Blackaby, Howard Hendricks, Billy Graham, Vance Hafner, uh, the opportunities of uh, getting blessed through His Word, uh, just an enormously good source. 
And it's available on the computer if you have an iPad uh, or an iPod. You can, you can program it in there and uh, it could be a real blessing to you. I wish you well. Uh, I hope that the work you do, some of the work you do, you won't, you won't have a clue until you're in heaven. And those people that you touched and the Lord used you to touch will be blessed. Let's pray. Father, for this group, preparing for the end of another semester of studies, we pray, God, that this second Advent would motivate us to purify ourselves, watch, be alert, that, Lord, when that trumpet calls, that we get to see you face to face. We don't want to be ashamed. Help us, our Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Gentlemen, thanks for the privilege of being here.